My name is Dave Hollenbach, the host of From Embers to Excellence, a podcast that explores the many facets of leadership from the perspectives of some amazing people. We discuss the triumphs and failures that have shaped our lives and our leadership philosophies. I've found that it isn't whether we fail that defines us, but when we do fail, how we respond. Leaders dust off the ashes and use their failures as fuel to work harder and as lessons to come back wiser and stronger, more resilient, more determined, and more committed to excellence. Today, I'm talking with Dr. Marissa Pei. Uh, some know her as the Asian Oprah. She was born in Ontario, Canada, raised there uh, prior to moving and settling in Long Beach, California. She has multiple degrees, um, bachelor's and master's, one of her master's degrees from McMaster University, her PhD from Alliant International University in California. She is a retired professor having taught at Boston University, UCLA, Alliant International University. And um, she's the morning show host for, uh, what is it, CNBC's uh, NBC. And not only that, but we're, we're going to talk about your book, uh, Eight Ways to Happiness. Um, but before we get into that, I'd, I'd kind of like to get a little idea of your, your life growing up in Canada, um, what your family was like. Uh, parents, that sort of thing. <laughs> How long do we have? <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks. Thanks for uh, having me on your show and delighted to be here. And I am, let's see, I am a, I was born in a really small town called Kitchener Waterloo amongst the largest community of Germans outside of Germany. So ich spreche Deutsch, ich habe drei Jahre in die Schule Deutsch gelernt. And if you see me, you can see that that kind of looks weird because I don't look like uh, the average German young woman. I'll say young. Um, I'm ageless, by the way. But uh, I grew up with a lot of contrast. I was made fun of a lot because I did not uh, resemble the, the majority. And I also grew up to first generation Chinese immigrants. And so the contrast at home between uh, my friends who grew up in a regular Canadian family and my you know, very strict Chinese culture uh, when I did my interview, I was highlighted as a Women's History Month special by Fox BC. See, Fox doesn't do everything bad. Um, <laughs> they actually did that special and, and called my mom a, a, a tiger mom on steroids. And so that contrast between you know, having to get straight A's, having to be, you know, I didn't have a radio until I was 18, didn't go to the theater until I was 21. All I knew was to study and, uh, you know, going over to my girlfriend's place and her mom telling her to clean up her room. And her response was, if you yell at me again, I'm going to report you to Child Protective Services. That was a big <laughs> contrast between uh, how I was raised and what I saw around me. So I would say I grew up kind of confused, kind of ashamed of my Chinese culture, uh, kind of wanting to be the girl next door, uh, kind of not liking myself. My, um, my, my cultural upbringing has this habit of criticizing. So I was called fat, ugly, and clumsy my entire life because in part in my culture and part my mom's um, steroid tiger mom-ness, uh, that's considered normal to motivate you not to be fat, ugly, and clumsy. So if I tell you you are, then you have enough motivation not to be. So as you can imagine, I, I fell and, and there was you know um, lots of different kinds of trauma, not just emotional. 
And so I, when I wrote the book, I did not write Eight Ways to Happiness from Wherever You Are from the vantage point of I'm a psychologist. My PhD is in organizational psychology, but I'm a psychologist uh, telling you how to be happy. That's not why the book was written. The book was written as a direct result of being someone, one of the eight out of 10, uh, as my honorable moniker Oprah will say, eight out of 10 of us were born into traumatic childhoods. Um, psychologists will say seven out of 10 or 94% of us were born in uh, some kind of trauma. Then, then that's why this book was born. The book was born out of someone who was raised with childhood trauma, who really did not believe she would ever be good enough or that she would ever be normal, quote unquote, or that, you know, she'd never get ahead of those who uh, knew that they were good enough because I was told I wasn't. So, so what I found as, uh, you know, as an organizational psychologist as well, working with really successful leaders in very uh, large organizations that because that is the majority of us that have had childhood trauma. Isn't it interesting why we think there's something wrong with us? If we're the majority in every other, in every other faction of life, if you're the majority you rule, but why is it if we're the majority that have been hurt as children, why do we think there's something wrong with us? And so a lifetime of therapy, being condemned to always have problems with self-esteem, uh, a, a life uh, of, of uh, revisiting trauma over and over and over again, I began to question that BS, that belief system that, I, that was uh, common to me, that I embraced because that's what I was told. You know, I needed to be fixed. Uh, I, I, I remember going to a psychologist who said, I'm surprised you're not clinically depressed with the trauma that you went through. So it began this journey to me to understand the role of trauma, the role of pain in life, the role of having horrible things happen to you as children, the role of having tragedy strike when you're an adult. So I, uh, th this exploration very personally uh, led me to the truth. And the truth is that if you were hurt and damaged, so to speak, outside of yourself as a child, through no fault of your own, there is never anything to be sorry about. There's never anything that you need to uh, make up for or apologize for. If you were hurt as a child, molested, a beaten, um, raped, uh, uh, abandoned, you name every single hurt that a child can suffer, it was not because of anything you did or say. And should it, should, should it have happened? That's not the question. It happened. So if it happened, and as an adult, uh, you know, if someone close to you uh, died tragically or suffered, or you went through some mental anguish, uh, PTSD, whatever the, 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 the fulcrum of pain was, that was not your fault, then that pain is just what it is. It's pain. Pain from life is mandatory. However, and here's the drop the mic, suffering is optional. So pain in life is mandatory, whether you had it in childhood or middle adult or adult or later adult, pain in life is mandatory. COVID was pain, pain that, that pain hit everybody. That was mandatory, it happened. We couldn't avoid it, it just happened. Now suffering from the pandemic, that's optional. Suffering from pain in your past is optional. And I tell my coaching clients all the time, you can choose to spend another three decades 
going to therapy every week and revisiting that pain of whatever it is and feeling righteously indignant about what happened to you. You have every reason to because it should not have happened. However, you can choose to do that and still drag along that pain that was true and real, but the responsibility for dragging it there to here, that's on you. So nothing's on you in the past. Nothing's on you, whatever that trauma was, but it is on you. It is on me. It is on us, whether we drag it like oversized luggage, like you know, it has to be in the special bin, right? It, it, that's on us. And so what we've done, especially as Americans, you know, the, the uh, hashtag BC19, the time before COVID, I would say, you know, one out of four, actually, I didn't say that, the statistics were one out of four Americans were on antidepressants and anti-anxiety medication. So that tells me we were not happy. 25% of us at least were not happy. And it's even higher, obviously, now. So, so that tells me that if we're not happy, some of that is mandatory, but some of that is optional. So if you are a person who either, there's two extremes, you don't deal with it at all, it's the past, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, you don't ignore it because you can't change it and just move on. What happens with that extreme reaction to past pain is once you press down garbage, what happens? It turns into liquid, you press down liquid, it turns into gas. Next thing you know, you got gas running out of you and everybody else can smell it, but you can't. And that's what midlife crises is. That's what a midlife, what I call opportunity is. It's people who have shoved stuff down so deep that somewhere around midlife, no matter how successful you've been, you start having weird things start happening. Like you cry all the time for no reason, or you have a deep, deep sense of darkness for no reason, or you have this, this feeling of unfulfillment and you have everything you have around you, but you still feel like that. Anthony Bourdain, Robin Williams, Kate Spade, all of those examples that all the things that are supposed to make you happy won't because it's an inside out job. So the people who are feeling these weird things and there's no real explanation, I would ask you, what kind of pain have you shoved down so far that you have not dealt with because you didn't want to or could not? It's time. It's time to process through. You don't have to go for 50 years of therapy, but you do have to deal with that pain once and for all. And the book has exercises. It, it, it takes you through all those dark places, like everybody of us have that dark hole in front of us that we think if we jump in, we're going to end up being like Humpty Dumpty, billion pieces, can't put it together. So we avoid the black hole. But it's really true. I promise you, the book, if you do the exercises, all of them, you will never hate yourself the same way again. Because I go down there with you, hold your hand, hold a flashlight, we go dig out all the shit, Taki, out of that hole. We find the beautiful, one-of-a-kind, wonderful seed that you are, and then shovel the shiitake back as fertilizer. So we recognize it's not what was done to you, it what was done for you. And that journey is such a beautiful, scary, wonderful, incredible, must-do journey for all of us if we want to have some level of happiness in our lives, some level of peace of mind some level of peace of heart. And that you asked me uh, in the pre-interview, you know, if I have any other books or if I have another, you know, everybody's asking me to write another book, but I'm not done with this book because the potential of this book that has already helped thousands of people, actually we're into 6 million now, unfortunately not that many copies of the book have sold, but I'm on a happy 88 mission and I've been on tour with the book and I've gone to China. I was 10 miles from Wuhan in November, right before COVID hit. I was in Philippines on the number one station, you know, sharing a stage with uh, uh, Pacquiao and 
And, and so my numbers of, of viewers who've gotten this message is 6 million. So I had to move my 8 million to 88 million more happy people in the next eight years because it's, it's so important for all of us. We're never going to get to world peace if we are not at peace with ourselves. And so that's one extreme. The other extreme is if you're marinating in your pain. So if you are just constantly revisiting and finding the pain from your past or the pain from your trauma, like a warm blanket, then you're also, you know, it's good you're feeling the pain. But I would say, you know, there's, there's definitely a downside in marinating in that pain. <laughs> like you just blew my mind oh good like, i love it when i blow people's minds <laughs> no, i told you you wouldn't need to ask me a lot of questions <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm just uh, i've got just my my brain is going a million different directions on all the questions i could ask you right now um I'm well without a doubt I'll be reading your book um, <laughs> kind of <laughs> <laughs> yeah and there's tools in there I mean it, it, a lot of it is you know we're really good analyzers right we we read a book and we go oh yeah that's great and then we forget what, what it was we read. And so I chalked it full of practical exercises. So one of them is the 21 day fast from complaining. So if you're feeling negative a lot and you're frustrated because you can't seem to find your way out of that, join the fast for 21 consecutive days. If you don't complain, which is a habit, I guarantee you, you're going to start feeling different because what we don't realize as human beings, especially as Americans, that we have advocated our number one tool in life, our number one weapon of happiness is choice. And we've abdicated our choice to this. First thing in the morning, what are we doing? We're scrolling, right? We're looking, oh, what, what, what the news? Oh, oh, who said what? And, oh, oh, how could they say what? What? What's wrong with people? That's how we've lost sight of choice. We allow what's happening, the condition, that's why I call it my newest hashtag, unconditional happiness, where my happiness does not rely on what conditions are around me. That, if you can get that, if you can, then even COVID can't touch me. I mean, COVID did touch me. Trust me, it touched me a lot. My entire tour of years, and we're talking lots of wonderful money, <laughs> gone because I couldn't do it. I was literally grounded. And then, so what did I do? Whenever something uh, happens that I don't like, I get mad. I express because I can't pretend like, you know, Remember in Seinfeld, uh, George Costanza's father in that one episode where he would go, serenity now, serenity now. Remember that? And yes. then by the end of the episode, he took a bat to a million dollars worth of computer equipment because, <laughs> you know, he didn't express what he needed to expect. So I'm all about, I'm not walking around. I'm fine. I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine. I'm, I'm okay. I'm fine. You know, fine stands for effed up, irrational, neurotic, and emotional. So, so I'm not fine. I didn't like what happened. So I stomp my feet. I growl. I jump up and down for 16 seconds because I'm a law of attraction student. And I know that every 16 seconds I attract what I'm doing or what I'm thinking. So I get out of the negative And then I say this most important question. I can't wait to see what good comes out of this with as little or as much sarcasm as needed. <laughs> and, and when I did that during the pandemic, guess what happened? I came up with my first film. I made my first short film called The New PPP, Post-Pandemic Possibilities. 
I have one film festivals that just asked for a download to look at it in more detail. So I'm excited. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen to it, but I, I was inspired by um, the poet laureate at the inauguration. So I woke up and I had a poem that I put to film. So that was what happened. Who knows what's going to happen? This number one best-selling book, number four on Denver Post, number one on Amazon, eight bestseller lists, um, hugely uh, had lots of uh, Layla Ali endorsed. I mean, just Neil Donald Walsh endorsed it on the back cover. All these great things. You know, do you, I, do you think I had a plan to write that book? No. The book came out of losing a $200,000 consulting project. I lost the project because I got a call from HR saying, your sponsoring executive just got fired. Your contract's null and void. I went ah, for 16 seconds in the garage, <laughs> tore up the contract. And then I said, I, can't, uh, I said, I can't wait to see what good comes out of this. And the voice said, write. And I said, I don't have time to write. And the voice said, you do now, has sense of humor. So I sat down and wrote. I wrote the first chapter out of, out of, um, out of, <laughs> it's been a while since I looked at my book. No, uh, I want to get it right. So the first chapter is out of loneliness. I was going to say out of hope, and that's not right. Out of loneliness into hope. And the last chapter is out of control into happiness. I wrote it, took me a week. I sat, just wrote. I swear to God, this happened. Sunday night, I finished the first and uh, last chapter. Monday morning, I get an email saying, we follow uh, motivational speakers on LinkedIn, found you on LinkedIn. Are you writing anything? It was a West Coast publisher. I swear, I, I'm like, are you kidding me? I sent it in. I got a book contract the next day. And I didn't go with them, but I got two more offers. I had three offers, no literary agent, no plan to be a best-selling author. I'm sure in the back of my mind, you know, one day, but uh, that's what happens. This is the joy ride of my life. This is because I feel what I feel and I don't get stuck in lower level feelings because it doesn't feel good. It's not good for my health. It's not good for my mental health. It's not good for my creativity. I cannot be inspired to create, and we're all creators. I cannot be inspired if I'm always crying about what happened to me, justified or not. You know, this same mom, I talk to her every single day. Why? The, the chapter four is out of hatred into forgiveness. I forgave her, not because she deserved it, nor do I condone her behavior, but she really did the very best that she could. She did. That's all she knew. She did one step better than my grandmother. You know, and if you go to people who abuse, abusers abuse, and they were abused. I, uh, what is the latest is 80, 87% of those in prison were molested, beaten, you know, so, so hello, it continues. But we have to understand the role of pain in life. It is to chisel us. It is, you know, like it or not, it is for our divine and best good. Now I can, um, I can tell you that, and you can argue with me and say, but Dr. Marissa, you know, um, it didn't have to be like that. I'll give you that. Didn't have to be like that. It was wrong. I'll give you that too. It was wrong. No parent should do that to your, their child. No priest should do that to, to, to a kid. No, I mean, it's wrong. I'll give you that. And so where are you going to go with that? You're not going up. Up is unlimited possibilities. You're going to stay there. You're going to stay at that baseline. You're going to be angry. You're going to hate. You're going to want revenge. You're going to be host hostile. The two emotions that will make your, you sick, and this is, no, this is from Deepak Chopra, that's been validated in medicine now, anger and hostility. If you live in anger and hostility, you will make yourself sick, physically sick. Three emotions that will make your cells 
uh, move in harmony. Love, peace. And the third one is not joy, it's actually creativity. So that's why I tell my clients, start writing, start, you know, do music, pick up a hobby, learn another language, use something that will make your body heal from the inside out with your emotion, instead of you letting emotions take you down. Let your emotions bring you back, bring you up. That's awesome. <laughs> Did I get speechless number two? <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> so, it, it's, it's so incredible. Um, you know, we were talking about the book that I wrote, which it is much different than eight ways to happiness. It's like a leadership philosophy kind of strategy book, but in there, I do talk about my own journey and, you know, I, I've studied many different religions and, um, different philosophies. I studied Buddhism for a while. I, uh, my biggest thing right now, I, I really like reading uh, Stoic philosophy, you know, Cato, Seneca, Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus. And a lot of what you're saying is echoed in, in those teachings. And it really, you can find everything that you're saying in just about every religion, every uh, type of philosophy that is about improving the human condition. And it just, I like how you talk about it because it's uh, just, there isn't any. Um, I'm not selling anything. Right. It, it, <laughs> I it, mean, maybe my book. But, <laughs> no, it, it's but, but I'm not, yeah, I'm not selling the book for me. I'm really, honestly, I'm selling the book for you. I, because I really, really, truly believe that if we are going to capitalize on this thing called life with a capital L and have the kind of creative solution to all ailments on the planet, then we all got to get good with us. We all have to, we can't, with all this war on everything is not gonna get us where we wanna go. You know, George Floyd dying and being murdered and now the reaction uh, to hate uh, blue lives, that's not gonna do it. Uh, to hate white people is not gonna do it. Um, to, uh, uh, well, the crime against Asian Americans, that's horrible, but uh, going out and, and, and now um, hating white people that are, you know, or any, that's not going to do it. We have to get to that point of, okay, where am I in all of this? Where am I in all of this? First and foremost, I love this African American saying, when there is no enemy within, no enemy outside can hurt me. When there is no enemy within, no enemy outside can hurt me. It's a, a, a philosophical way of saying, can't touch this. <laughs> That's so <laughs> Never said it like that. I like that. So can't, you know, honestly, a lot of the conflict that comes is because we are just not okay with us. We're walking around who likes me, who loves, it's worse now with social media. How many likes am I getting? How many comments am I getting? Who likes me? Who respects me? Who thinks I'm great? Do you think you're great? Like, seriously, do you approve of yourself 80% of the time? Do you think you are loving, lovable, and loved 80% of the time? Do you think you're pretty cool 80% of the time? And most people can't say that because they're angry at someone who insulted them or what happened to them in the past or what's happened to them now, they're, or they hate their job, I'll live for my weekends, you know, that's not loving, hello, it's two days out of seven, you're kind of losing out on the ratio. So, you know, there's so many, it, it, we gotta get here, we gotta take that breath. 
<sighs> okay, right now, do I, am I good? Like, am I happy right now? Yeah, I kind of am. Like, I really am right now happy. I have food. I have a roof. I have work that I love. I'm talking to a cute guy on the, on the uh, <laughs> screen. <laughs> My daughter's in the other room working because she decided to come visit me. I just left a, a, a drive up the coast for uh, 4th of July. I've got, you know, um, a bonus mom and dad that live not too far away and my my bio you know i know my bio dad's in heaven i, I mean i'm good i'm fundamentally 80 percent good now am i perfect no i i know i've lost you know financially from from covid but i'm the same person that made money before i can still make money now i just got to get a little more creative around it. that's all you know we're all that way but until we get to that point where I'm pretty solid in where I am, then I can't go and help anyone else because then I get mad if they're not helped, you know, or, or I'll get mad if they're not doing what I want them to do. That they're none of your business. You are your business. When you're at a point where you can look at yourself and be, I'm okay. That's why I say, you got to take a bite of my gratitude sandwich. If you're not happy right now, if your mind is stuck in things that hurt you, then you got to take a bite of my gratitude sandwich. Eight specific gratitudes at the beginning of the day and plug your phone in a different room. You wake up, you sit up, you just take some breaths, you go through eight specific gratitudes. Dr. Wayne Dyer, who's also in heaven with my dad, said five, I'm an overachiever, I say eight. And by the way, if you're wondering what the heck, I always say eight or 88, what's up with that? So I know you thought I was Swedish, but I actually am Chinese. And eight's a lucky number in Chinese. It is a homonym for good fortune. So eight specific things in the morning. And then here's the ticket. The bottom of the bun is not about being grateful for what happened during the day. It's about appreciating yourself. So most of us don't do that very well. If we get 99 compliments and one insult, our mind goes to the insult. We have a very active critic. I'm my own worst enemy. I'm harder on myself than anybody else is. I, you know, if you have that going on, you're a perfectionist and it is a dis-ease that is robbing you of happiness. So if you're a person that's saying that, I got two words for you. Stop it and take a bite of my gratitude sandwich. At the end of the night, you say, what do I appreciate about me? What did, what was I able to do today? What was I able to say today that made me feel good? Oh, well, I looked in the mirror and I smiled at my reflection instead of looking for all of the flaws. That's a good thing. That's one. So you do that as a practice. It's part of a discipline that you have every single day. 21 days, no, no uh, complaining. And then a gratitude sandwich for 21 days that becomes so delicious that you want to do it every day. It just makes you feel better. You tell me, do you want to start your day doing this? and finding all the things that are wrong with people? Or do you want at the end of the day, uh, uh, instead of thinking about, oh, I can't believe they said that about me. How dare they say that about me? Or, oh, I didn't get that done. And now I've got oh, someone, do uh, you want to go? To no wonder you have sleep problems. No wonder we have sleep problems as Americans. If you're thinking about that bullshit talkie before you go to bed, you're going to have sleep problems. You got to think about what did I do? Have I done the best that I can with the time that I have, with the resources I have? That's the question I ask myself before I go to bed. And the answer is yes, I did the best that I could. Then I can also give you the credit and say you did the best that you can with the time that you had and the resources. And if you weren't a great person, it's okay. 12% of the time, you're not a great person. 12% of the time, I'm not a great person and I'm good with that. I'm not trying to be 100%, 88% is great. As long as you're not my pilot on an airplane going somewhere. <laughs> oh. <laughs> your, your upbringing um, in, in Canada, Chinese parents, 
and very, very strict upbringing. Was your life after high school, your adulthood kind of mapped out for you? Did you know that you were, was it expected of you to go to college, get your master's, your PhD, all of that? Yeah, it absolutely was. But I was an extreme disappointment because my father was a chemical engineer, a professor and uh, successful. Uh, he died of lymphoma at the age of 70. So pretty early, he had just retired. Um, but he, you know, from the time I was four, I knew I was going to get a PhD. However, he thought that I would be an engineer or a mathematician because I did very well in the PISA. So he was really, you know, gunning for that. So psychology is like stripping in uh, Chinese culture. It's like, <laughs> It's really bad. Let me tell you, mm -hmm. uh, I, I still remember I have a cousin who, whose daughter, you know, was trying to you know, figure out what, what she wanted to take in college. And he wouldn't let her talk to me because he did not want her to go into psychology. Okay. So, so yes, I did know I was going to get an advanced degree, but a lot of that was tied into trying to get rid of those voices that told me I was not good enough. And this is another common thing amongst children who have some trauma. They, they translate, uh, you're not good enough to overachievement. And it's another dis-ease. You are uh, A plus, you're not an A personality, you're an A plus personality. You've got to do every, everything the fastest and the youngest and the most uh, you know, recognized and all of that BS belief system that, that keeps you unhappy because I can tell you right now, I know there a large percentage of, of the people listening can identify with, with, you know, being put on a pedestal and told, wow, is there anything you don't do? And then you, you know, thank you very much. And, you know, somebody compliments you. And then on the inside, the voice goes, ha, they only like you because they don't know you. If they really knew who you were, they wouldn't like you. And you're not all that don't get all full of yourself. So those voices from the critic are so strong that no matter what you achieve, it's not good enough. And then the other thing that happens is you choose mates that remind you of how unworthy you are. So it's very common for children of trauma to choose men or women, you know, either, uh, either way or same sex um, partners that uh, treat them in the same way as they believe about themselves growing up. So I believed I was unattractive because I was told I was fat, ugly, and um, clumsy. And so I picked a man who actually would introduce me to his friends behind my back as obese. And I was thinner then than I am now, but I, I picked him as, as, a symbol of, I knew he didn't love me, but I was going to make him love me the same way I was going to make my mom love me. No matter what she did, I was going to make her love me. And so I picked someone who had that same, you know, it was never going to happen, but I was going to die trying. I almost died trying. So, um, but I'm grateful. I'm happily divorced, but I picked them. You know, here's the other thing. When you have a bad relationship, we lose, that's chapter five, you know, out of heartbreak back into love. We have this weird, um, you know, BS belief system about relationships. There's only one, it's your soulmate. You spend your life looking for your soulmate and they're going to complete you. And they're the one riding it on the horse and all that bullshit talking that keeps us in these horrible relationships that don't work or afraid to have a relationship because it won't work. And, and, and again, if, you know, I don't hold the, I don't hold the Bible on healing, but I do hold one way of healing. So if you've tried other ways and you haven't tried mine, or if you, you know, you've tried others, I'm not saying you don't need me. If you're, if you're in a good place, that's great. But I'm speaking to those who are listening right now who absolutely are so stuck in their past pain or present pain or future fear. And fear stands for 
future events already ruined. So if that's you and you don't want to be there, do the exercises in the book because you got the buck stops right over here. And you can spend the rest of your life blaming your husband <laughs> as I could be doing because I lost a lot of money because I picked also picked a man who didn't like to work. So I lost quite a bit, but I could justifiably be angry at him for the rest of my life. And who is that going to hurt? And who is that going to help? So this book is about fully taking responsibility for your life. And the only one, really, if you're ready to stop pointing the finger outside of yourself and tough love yourself a little bit, <laughs> then you're ready for my book. The inspiration for you or really what set you on the trajectory to, to get advanced degrees in psychology and, and then, I, well, organizational psychology and you also, you were a professor in uh, business, a professor of business. And I'm quite certain that organizational psychology is very useful in the business world. Um, now, not only that, but learning psychology and what makes people tick was also very useful for you to heal the, those past traumas. But I would imagine that it's not all just your mom saying that you're fat, ugly, and clumsy. There's, I, I just, based on our earlier conversation and things that you've said, I would imagine that there's, there's quite a bit more trauma in your past. And probably quite a bit that um, other people can relate to. Do you talk at all about any of those specific traumas in your book? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, my husband cheated on me. So I have that down. I know what that feels like. Uh, I know what it's like to be cornered in a stairwell and said, Chinese, Japanese, dirty news, look at these. You know, I, I know what it's like to be uh, told, you know, that casual sex is part of college life and know that it meant nothing your first time. Can't believe I said that. I've never shared that one. Um, <laughs> uh, I've had, you know, uh, uh, stabbed in the back by certain people. I've been stabbed in the front by institutions and or friendship. And, 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 and this is, and this is my, my fundamental point is that when you've had trauma, you are uniquely able to help people in a way that people who've never gone through that trauma can. So at some point, if you can make the pivot at that very, very, very strong vital point of turning what was done to you as what was done for you, you're going to have an amazing life. But if you get stuck with that broken record of this is what was done to me and you can't get out of that, you're not going to have a very happy life. You might, you know, if you're Shirley MacLaine, you might get another round at it. But, you know, for me, it's like, I don't, not positive where I came from, not positive where I'm going, even though the people who've gone and come back say it's a, an amazing place. So I'm not afraid of it. But I do know that I have this little dash that I'm in right now. And I can either choose to see it as a joy ride or I can see it as life sucks. That's my choice. Your biggest tool is the C word. It is not collaboration or compromise. It's choice. You have the choice. Einstein says that the most important question that a human being has to answer is, is the universe friendly or not? If you choose to say the universe is not friendly, then you're going to have a sucky life because you're going to hold yourself back. You're going to hold your breath, waiting for the other shoe to drop, thinking about all the bad things that have happened to you, worst case scenario, paranoia, conspiracy theory, all time high. 
all of that, it's going to not, you're, you're right, you're going to have a sucky life. I, I guarantee you. But if you choose, if you choose, even with COVID, yes, COVID was bad. Yes, you know, maybe someone had it out for you, but they, whoever uh, created COVID, it, it hit everybody. It's not personal. So, so I know, and I choose to believe that the universe is friendly for one reason. The planets did not crash into each other last night. I'm still here. <laughs> I can still live today. I still have a day ahead of me, right? I still have most likely tomorrow. I, I, I'm, I, I most likely have at least 10 more years. And dang it, I'm going to use those 10 years and juice the shiitake out of them because it won't come back. I don't get a do-over unless I'm Shirley McLean. I don't have a do-over. So every day is my choice today. What do I want to do today? Although the more connected I meditate every day for 15 minutes, that's all I need. Don't do any more than that because I want to live my life. That's how, you know, the friendly universe wants it. The same friendly universe that made sure that every drop of water, every grain of sand, every leaf on the tree, every um, uh, uh, blade of grass is different. Every snowflake, all different, uniquely, one of a kind, wonderful, just like the 7.3 billion of us human beings on the planet. I know that I have a place here, not because somebody published an article saying I have a place here. I know because I do the bliss of one, I knew the work and I am connected to that energy that is the source of creation, right? And creativity that I have so much to do, right? Right now, I'm pretty clear. Happiness is my brand. It's my message. It's what I'm supposed to do. That may change. I don't know. It's a pretty big brand. I could die doing this and still not hit my 88 million, but it's okay. I love it. But honestly, I've gotten to the point where, you know, I have my show, which is every day now. I just got promoted to the morning show on CNBC, uh, NBC News Radio, KCAA. The name of the show is Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa. I've been on for 484 consecutive shows. Um, I, I love it. I, it's a lot of work, but I, I love doing it. And so, you know, what's next? I don't know, but I'm in the flow. I just follow impulses, right? I do what's put in front of me. Um, I, I just happen to, you know, <laughs> now I'm a beat reporter with the New York news agency. So what better way than to go from one show a week to five mornings a week than actually be sent on location to things that I can put on my show. And the ones that I take are what's right with people. I just did one with a Cal Fire, right? I, in, I interviewed the uh, fire chief. They had a buyback firework program. I just stopped at the Seal Beach police. They have a sticker for special needs homes when you know police are called there. These are all part of solution. These are all part of you know what's right with people. That's my message. That's my life. That's what I get to do. How cool is that? So, you know, you have a choice where to tune in. You can go to the, the major networks that, uh, you know, if it bleeds, it leads. Lead, yeah. Or you can, oh, I'm going to go follow Dr. Marissa. And, you know, she's going to get me to drink rose colored Kool Aid first thing in the morning. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I have social media. You can follow me. Go to my YouTube channel. You can see all my past shows. And that, you know, that's it, surround yourself with people who make you feel good. If someone doesn't make you feel good, I, I love this. I, I actually wrote it on a poster. If you don't like what you're looking at, quit looking at it. You know, instead of what we normally do is we look at it, uh, and then you go tell somebody, uh, look at this, uh, and then you get a group doing a chat, uh, look at this, and <laughs> your, your whole day's gone. You'll not get that time back. And what have you helped? What, what have you done? You've just spread and spewed more of what's wrong than what's right. You're incredible. I wish I had Aww. met you many years ago. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> That's um, so sweet. 
I, uh, I, I'm so grateful that I finally met you and that you agreed to allow me to interview you. Actually, uh, just what a great conversation. And for, for your book, is there a preferred uh, place where you know you'd want people to to buy it from? Well, um, you know, you you can get a cheaper copy. Sometimes Amazon puts it on sale. You can actually get it at Walmart and Target, which I'm thrilled about that they picked it up. But um, I would love you to buy it straight from me, only because I can sign it for you. And the hard copy you can get on my website, drmarissa.life. And um, uh, I'll, I'll personalize it. It's a great gift. And the audio book is actually narrated by me. You can get that on Audible, but I prefer it if you got it from me because then part proceeds from my purchases go to my nonprofit. So it's kind of like the, the, the shoe thing, buy one, give one. If you buy from me, I give one through my nonprofit. So I have uh, a nonprofit called Eight Ways to Happiness, and it helps young adults, teens, and kids who have temporarily forgotten their birthright to happiness. And so I give out though this book as well as I have a children's book called Mommy, What Are Feelings? So if you're a parent, I would love you for every $25 donation, you get a copy of the book to download as many times as you want and the kids color in their feelings. And it's especially good for parents who were taught not to feel growing up like me. So uh, every feeling has a taste, touch, sight, and sound. They were drawn by my uh, daughters when they were five and seven. They're now 23 and 21. But uh, this is a good one. This is scared. <laughs> So, uh, and, and it's like it rhymes. Oh no, this is frustrating. I'm sorry. Frustrated looks like a black thunder cloud. Frustrated sounds like a whine or a growl. Frustrated feels like a shoelace gone wild. And frustrated tastes like a gingerbread child. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's really kind of cool. I'm looking for a new publisher actually to produce the hard copy because they're so expensive because they're laminated. So you can draw on it, but for right now, the ebook you can download and and just do uh, paper. But uh, yeah, so it's all at drmarissa.life. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, I'm all over social. Doc Balance on Instagram. Dr. Marissa everywhere else. LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Facebook page. Blah 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 blah. And uh, I, you know, if you want a free happiness tip sheet, please go to. Um, uh, my website and, and just sign up to be part of my happy 88 tribe. You get a free tip sheet. I, I, I rarely email, so you don't have to worry about spam. <laughs> I've got this list that I don't use, but it's, uh, it's, I, I, you know, where to find me. That's my excuse. So, well, but I, I would like to give your listeners, anyone that um, does want a copy of the book and goes to my website and puts in their, from embers to excellence. Oh, good. From embers to excellence or Dave or whatever. <laughs> Just put um, um, Asian Oprah giveaway. And then what I'll do is if you buy the book, I'll give you the children's book and vice versa. That's, that's, that's great. your offer. Awesome. I will have all of that in the show notes. Um, it'll be uh, attached to the YouTube video when I upload that. And um, the uh, podcast. When I upload that in the show notes, your website will be there and the title of your book. And just, man, this was, uh, this was really awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Marissa. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. It was fun. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you for listening to this episode of From Embers to Excellence. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Follow me on your favorite podcast platform and visit hollenbachleadership.com for additional content. My goal is and always will be to add value to as many people as possible. So if I can be of any assistance to you or someone you know, 
please connect with me via email or on one of my social media accounts linked on the homepage of my website. Remember, our failures don't define us unless we let them, and the only true measure of a leader is the success of their team.